Hello, and welcome to the Sarcoma Foundation of America's panel discussion on liposarcoma. My name is Dean Freilich, and I'm the Director of Scientific Affairs at SFA. Thank you for taking the time to join us for what promises to be a very interesting session. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly go over the format and logistical details of this webinar. I will be serving as the moderator for today's session. We have two panelists who will provide an introduction to liposarcoma in the context of sarcoma diagnosis and care, as well as the state of liposarcoma research and clinical trials. After the, their presentations, we will have a questions and answer session. SFA moderators will pose questions submitted to our panelists. At any time during today's session, you can submit your questions by entering them in the questions field at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists will not be able to answer questions related to your specific medical situation, so please make sure that they are related to the topics raised during the session. The information in this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. It is not a substitute for medical advice from your physician about your specific situation. Today's session is being recorded and a link will be posted to SFA's website. Lastly, as a reminder, all participants are muted. My name is Christy Aristian. I'm SFA's Program Manager for Engagement and Research. Following today's session, participants who are liposarcoma patients or caregivers will have the opportunity to participate in a survey about their experience with liposarcoma. This survey was generated as a partnership between SFA and Boehringer Ingelheim and represents an opportunity for patients and caregivers to share their experiences with diagnosis, treatment, and care in order to help inform the development of new and more effective therapies that support quality of life. This is your opportunity to make your voice heard and share your experiences. This survey is also available on SFA's website if you would like to access it at a later time, and those patients and caregivers who complete the survey will be compensated for their time. Now I would like to introduce our panel members. Dr. Pollock is the current director of the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center and the Kathleen Klotz Chair in Cancer Research. He is a professor of surgical oncology at the Ohio State University College of Medicine and professor emeritus in the Department of Surgical Oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Pollock has held a number of leadership positions at both MD Anderson and the Ohio State University, including Distinguished Chair, Director of Division of Surgical Oncology, Distinguished Teaching Professor, and Surgeon-in-Chief. He has lectured internationally, participates on numerous advisory boards and steering committees, including our own, and has served as an editor for many esteemed academic journals. He has authored over 300 peer-reviewed publications and 90 books and book chapters. Dr. Schwartz is the current director of the Case Western Reserve Comprehensive Cancer Center and vice dean for oncology at Case University School of Medicine. He also cares for patients at the university hospitals and Cleveland Clinic. Previously, Dr. Schwartz was the chief of hematology and oncology at Columbia University Medical Center Deputy and Interim Director of the Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center and Chief Attending of the Sarcoma Melanoma Oncology Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Schwartz has received numerous honors and awards, including SFA's Nobility in Science Award in 2017. He has authored over 250 peer-reviewed publications and 35 books, book chapters and editorials. Thank you both for joining us today. I will now hand it off to Dr. Pollock, who will begin our presentation. Thank you, Dean and uh, Christy. Uh, before we get into the presentation, I would just like to comment that both uh, Gary and I are currently directors of major cancer centers, but we actually have an abiding interest in sarcoma clinical care and research that goes back more than 30 years. And over that period of time, we've had the opportunity to work together in a number of projects. So I consider it an honor and a privilege to be able to share the podium with Gary. Thank you for your attention and deeply appreciate the SFA for putting this program forward. Some general comments about sarcoma as we then cone down into the liposarcoma story specifically. We frequently get asked the question, why, why should you spend an entire career studying a rare disease? And my answer is that there are a number of lessons that we have learned 
from sarcoma that can then be extrapolated to the larger uh, sarcoma uh, and uh, oncology solid tumor problems per se. For example, some milestones that were first achieved in sarcoma. This was the first successful use of neoadjuvant preoperative chemotherapy. It was the first disease in which clinical trials demonstrated that multidisciplinary treatment is superior to radical surgery alone, and it's the first disease in which molecularly targeted therapies were first successfully used. Next. Like all solid tumors, we have staging systems that are uh, designed to try to enable us to compare results across institutions and across times by equilibrating stage for stage a given disease. These are compiled on an every five to 10 year basis to be updated. And so this is the current AJCC sarcoma staging system looking at tumor whether or not there are N nodes present, whether or not there are M spread or metastases, and then the tumor itself is graded. So those are the four criteria, tumor size, presence of nodal metastasis, presence of distant metastasis and grade. And these can then be clustered into stages where treatments are according to the stage of presentation. Next slide. Now, some observations about sarcomas in general, many of which specifically apply to liposarcomas. First of all, they can be either pushing or infiltrating. The top panel shows a pushing thigh liposarcoma abutting on the outside of the pelvis, whereas the lower CAT scan panel shows a dedifferentiated liposarcoma that has invaded across the rib cage and is actually destroying uh, bones in that area. Next slide. These tumors can occur anywhere in the body, anywhere where there's connective tissue. Next slide. They can be very locally invasive. They can encase and destroy tissues. Here you see a bivalved uh, sarcoma that's actually donut shaped, and it's got the sciatic nerve, which is the main nerve in the posterior thigh, entrapped. You can see in the center how the nerve is being compressed and destroyed by the tumor. When you lose that nerve, your leg becomes insensate below the knee, and so this has very definite consequences to the patient. Next slide. They can destroy the quality of life. Next slide. They can be very locally recurrent. And this is a, a problem, particularly with liposarcoma, uh, as it has been experienced by this patient who underwent 13 operations before the tumor was finally ultimately controlled, and she's now been free of disease for an additional 15 years. Next slide. Local control can be very costly. This is a different type of a sarcoma, a so-called unclassified pleomorphic sarcoma. The old name was malignant fibrous histiocytoma. And you can see the sciatic nerve, which we just talked about, going up into the tumor and then exiting where the little blue elastic band is around the nerve itself. This leaves the operator with an unenviable choice of either dividing the nerve and accepting the functional deficit or potentially saving the nerve but leaving a positive margin in the hopes that the tumor will be further controllable with radiation after surgery. Next slide. There are a number of known causative factors. Uh, this is a, a dedifferentiated uh, liposarcoma that was induced by radiation therapy. If you look at the arrow carefully, this was a patient who had orthovoltage radiation in the early 1960s for a pediatric tumor, a Wilms tumor. And you can see the uh, partial atrophy of the 
the uh, abdominal muscles on the right side of this patient's abdomen. The bottom picture uh, shows the tumor after it has been successfully removed. Next slide. Next slide. Sarcomas can also be induced by chronic lymphedema. This is a lymphangiosarcoma of the left arm in a patient who previously had a stage one breast cancer that was treated with the combination of surgery and radiation. Next slide. The circle shows some areas with little purple dots. These are incipient lymphangiosarcomas within the patient's extremity, chronic lymphedema. Next slide. And this is what one of those tumors looks like after it's excised. Next slide. Another example, uh, a patient of mine originally from Egypt who has uh, filaria, which is a type of parasite that can destroy the lymphatics, and it resulted in elephantiasis of her extremities. Next slide. And here you can see those same purple to violaceous dots, which represent tumors in the chronic lymphedema bed. Next slide. Sarcomas can be very heterogeneous. A patient with a very large liposarcoma, and in the CAT scan, you can see both a dedifferentiated area as well as a well-differentiated area. You can see this both on the scan as well as in the microscopic appearance under the microscope. This is what that patient's tumor looked like when we started its operation. Next slide. And this is the operation after the tumor has been removed. Next slide. And as the nurse is observing, click. Sarcomas can also be very uh, angiogenic, meaning that they can scavenge blood vessels and even create new blood vessels as a way of sustaining their own growth. You can see sarcomas here involving the intestine with dense fronds of new vessels that have been grown out from the tumor itself. Next slide. And that circle just encloses an example of that. Next slide. Sarcomas can have multifocal skip lesions. This is a synovial sarcoma of the foot in which three separate sarcomas were identified. Next slide. But not all multifocal sarcomas are truly multifocal. A series of scans, click, click, and you can see what looks like three separate tumors. When we explored the patient, however, we found that they were all actually simply one tumor that were interconnected and very easy to remove. Next slide. Uncommon metastases occur commonly. This is an isolated liposarcoma that has metastasized only to the tip of the appendix. Next slide. Diagnostic images are not always accurate. This is a patient who was referred to me with allegedly an unresectable liposarcoma which you can see in the left side of the abdomen. It was thought to be unresectable because it crossed the midline and appeared to involve some of the major blood vessels that couldn't be removed. And it also looked like it was infiltrating the abdominal wall. But we thought that it would be important to actually explore the patient because the scan was not absolutely certain. And when we got inside, we found that this large tumor was actually very encapsulated and only attached to the backside of the stomach through a very narrow isthmus of tumor that's enclosed within the circle. Next slide. Not everything that looks like a sarcoma is a sarcoma. This is a benign poloides tumor of the breast. Next slide. How the biopsy is performed is critical. This is a patient who had a very small liposarcoma involving the patellar tendon. 
but the biopsy was performed in the manner that was not very useful to the patient. On the left, you can see a cruciate-shaped uh, biopsy scar. There's a little bit of redness because it's infected. And that entire area ultimately had to be removed surgically. As compared to the biopsy scar on the right side, where the scar is small, it's oriented parallel to the long axis of the extremity, and the scar and intervening tissue can be removed on block at the time of a definitive operation. Next slide. Another example to point out the importance of orienting the initial scar appropriately. This is a liposarcoma involving the deltoid muscle in this young man. And you can see the transverse scar by which the tumor was originally removed prior to development of this bulging recurrence, which is enclosed within the dotted black circle. Next slide. That's the original scar. Next slide. And you can see that to get total control of this area, a much larger excision had to be performed. Next slide. Next slide. Sometimes radical curative surgery can be life-saving as in this gentleman with this massive liposarcoma involving the groin. Next slide. However, sometimes very limited surgery, although not necessarily curative, can improve the quality of life. A patient with multiple focal liposarcomas that failed in the area of the uh, sternum, the, the chest bone, breast bone, and that was successfully dealt with by serial small local excisions, as you can see on the right. Next slide. Sometimes we're asked to simply perform debulking surgery to remove as much tumor as possible. And we've known for many, many years that that actually is generally not a very effective strategy. This is a series from Memorial Sloan Kettering in the late 1990s, showing what happens if you have a complete resection, in other words, margin negative or only margin microscopically positive, as shown with the green line, as compared to an incomplete resection, like a biopsy, or a tumor that's unresectable. The red line, which is incomplete resection, the blue line, which is unresectable, these are superimposable in terms of overall survival. So we generally try to avoid simple palliative debulking surgery. Next slide. However, some stage four sarcoma patients, even with metastases, can still be cured. This was the first published report of the sarcoma staging system in 1980. And you can see that even with stage four disease, 7% of those patients, a number of whom underwent surgical resection of their primary and their metastasis, remained alive even 10 years out from their previous treatment. Next slide. We know that the best outcomes are achieved by dedicated multidisciplinary teams. Next slide. An example, just looking at amputation rates in low volume sarcoma centers versus high volume centers. Uh, and that's the bottom line of this little chart. Click please. And at major sarcoma centers, the actual primary amputation rate is now significantly less than 1%. Next slide. There's a lot of controversy involving the use of radiation, and this cartoon demonstrates the problem. The purple encloses, uh, square encloses the macroscopic clinical tumor that could either be seen on CAT scan or potentially palpated. Click. The red includes those little white stippled dots. Those represent microscopically peritumoral invaded tissue. Next slide, click. And if you were going to use radiation before surgery, 
you would have to include that entire stippled area as well as a potential margin of resection, which is shown by the flesh colored box. If you waited until after surgery, theoretically, it, it would mean that a different field size would be feasible. Click. And the post-operative fields, because you have to incorporate that entire surgical field, as well as the radiation field, tend to be about 40% larger than preoperative fields. And at many institutions, there's actual financial cost. At our institution, one rad costs about $6.00 you have to use higher doses and that can average out to almost $2,000 more for post-operative radiation as compared to pre-op radiation. Interestingly, no conclusive clinical trials have ever been performed to demonstrate the superiority of one approach over the other. Next slide. We'd now like to focus in on some of the molecular biology that drives liposarcoma specifically. Some very important uh, genes are located on chromosome 12, which is a key area in liposarcoma because what ends up happening in many patients is that so-called ring chromosomes, as you can see in the little inset picture on the right, can form and within those ring chromosomes, there are areas of oncogenic abnormality as are listed in the slide. Probably the key molecular driver, certainly the one that has been most carefully studied is, make, uh, is MDM2, mouse double minute two. And in the ring chromosome, photomicrograph, those are areas that uh, show up as pink. Next slide. Why is that important? Well, the most common gene that is mutated in all types of sarcoma is P53, the so-called tumor surveillance gene, the policeman of the genome. And what ends up happening is MDM2 combined to that gene and ultimately target it for destruction. While differentiated liposarcoma, a very common variant of sarcoma, mostly has mutated P53 and amplified MDM2. And because the P53 is mutated, the MDM2 does not bind to it. In contrast, D-differentiated liposarcoma, the other most common variant of liposarcoma, mostly has normal wild type P53 and amplified MDM2. So that normal protective wild type P53 is overridden by the amplified anti-P53 MDM2 function. Next slide. Next slide. At this point, I'd like to turn the microphone over to my colleague, Dr. Schwartz, who will carry on. Gary? Well, thank you, Dr. Pollock. And I, I want to also convey my same sentiments. I've known Dr. Pollock for almost three decades, and it's been a real honor to share this podium with him and really work together on the advancement and cure of sarcoma, including liposarcoma, which is an area of interest to both of us. Uh, so with that in introduction, I, I, I'm going to focus more on the treatment of systemic therapies. And I would first add that in sarcoma, the only thing still curable is surgery. And I think the point is that the surgical expertise is critical to the success of the patient and the curability of the patient with sarcoma. So that one slide about low volume, high volume centers reflects the fact that in a high volume center, an academic center, there will be a team of physicians who have expertise in sarcoma. We're a rare breed. There aren't that many of us. So for en enough of us to get together as a group and have team-based approaches, the evaluation of a sarcoma has become the gold standard of how we evaluate patients with this disease. And I, can't, I'm not, I cannot underestimate the importance of making sure you have an expert surgeon 
an expert oncologist, radiotherapist, and pathologist, because this is a complex disease that's very difficult to, to diagnose without the right pathological assessment to ensure the right subtype of the disease. And that takes me to my first slide. Complex, sarcoma is a rare disease. Liposarcoma is one of multiple subtypes. This is a series, a whole series of memorial cell catering, and I was there of almost 10,000 patients, showing the heterogeneity, the diversity of sarcomas. Um, and, and liposarcoma is one of at least 60, if not more, sarcomas. And they're all histologically different, biologically different, and the treatments are vastly different based on the subtype. So establishing the right diagnosis is critical for how we approach this particular set of diseases. I tell my patients that as a sarcoma doctor, I'm not really a doctor for one tumor, I'm a doctor for 60 different cancers. And that's a complexity that few oncological gurus have to face when looking at a patient and telling them how best to take care of their dis different disease. Next slide. So liposarcoma. So it's, it itself is in fact one of five different tumor types, making this probably the most complex subtype of sarcoma. Now the most common type, which is the one Dr. Pollock has been focusing on predominantly, is a well-differentiated, de-differentiated liposarcoma. A sarcoma like this often starts as a relatively benign looking tumor. In fact, the well-differentiated almost looks like a lipoma, an absolutely benign mass in the soft tissue, but has a few abnormal cells and still fat cells that make it a well-differentiated subtype or the well-diff. The well-differentiated type will eventually transform over time to the more aggressive de-differentiated type. Now, if you look at the sensitivities, the systemic therapies, these are generally resistant to chemotherapy. I'm not gonna talk, spend much time or any time about the outcomes with chemotherapy, but they often use a drug called doxorubicin or a drug called doxel. Some people use it with a more aggressive drug called ifosamide. It depends on how advanced it is and how young the patient is. But generally, adromycin-based therapy is traditionally used, but the outcomes are not very good, responses are low, and toxicity is high. But Dr. Pollock mentioned several new oncogenic targets. I'm going to talk about those very Shortly, one's called cyclin-dependent kinase 4, CDK4, and the other is called MDM2. And both of these are amplified in sarcoma. And I'll come back to what that exactly means. And also in this well-differentiated, de-differentiated, and I put this well-diff, de-diff, because what we often see is components of both. Because remember, the well-diff will eventually transform to the de-diff. So half the tumor will be well-diff and half the tumor will be de-diff. We call that the well-diff D differential liposarcoma. As a group, they're also um, sensitive to a drug called aribulin. This drug was recently approved for sarcoma, particularly liposarcoma. I just say I'm not going to show the data, but for aribulin, the actual response rates are rather low. But for reasons we do not understand, aribulin does lead to uh, prolongation and survival when compared to control. Uh, and the biological basis of this is unclear but it's a drug systemic therapy we do use and it's approved particularly for liposarcoma. Now, as the other two, two tumor types, one's called mixoliposarcoma. This does not have that CDK4 MDM2 amplification. It has other oncogenic events. And often you will see another histological feature called round cells. And this reflects the degree of aggressiveness of the tumor. And the higher the round cell component, the more aggressive the tumor is. And that'll often influence the oncologist's decision whether to give postoperative chemotherapy after surgical resection. The more round cells, the greater the risk for metastatic disease. And the data would suggest, the randomized studies are, are a little bit lacking, that the round cell, high round cell mixoliposarcoma should, should get adjuvant systemic chemotherapy after surgery. And it is a chemotherapy-sensitive sarcoma, which makes it quite different from the well-differentiated, de-differentiated. And there's another drug we use in this disease also called trabectidine, and it is active in the mixed liposarcoma subtype. Now, trabectidine is approved in the well-differentiated, de-differentiated, 
However, the sensitivity of trabectidine for well diff DDIF is quite low, and I tend not to recommend it as a treatment option. Though, if you look at the label for trabectidine, it is approved for all liposarcomas, but the fact is it's only really active in the mixoliposarcoma, which is a very rare subtype, maybe 250 to 300 cases a year in the United States. And then finally, we have the pleomorphic variant, which is very aggressive. It's, it's a transformation, probably the well diff DDIF, though it may be a de novo sarcoma subtype. We use chemotherapy, but these tend to be very chemotherapy resistant. And the outcomes, unfortunately, with this sarcoma are not very good. Next slide, please. Well, this is liposarcoma. This is what it looks like under uh, on a CAT scan. We saw a lot of surgical samples from Dr. Pollock's uh, uh, overview. But I'm showing this because it reflects the difficulty of understanding how to treat it. Now, this is CT scan. It's, it's a, it's a cross-section. And what I'm showing you on, um, on, the, on one end of this is the well-differentiated liposarcoma. And the other side is the denser de-differentiated liposarcoma. That whole, tomb, whole thing that goes from the right side of the abdomen to the left is all a sarcoma, but the half is the more indolent well diff, and the other half is the more aggressive D diff. And the fact is that we have a, compos com a composition of two different sarcomas that act very differently, that we tend to treat this as a D diff. But you can imagine the complexity of surgical resection of such a large mass, and it takes the expertise of Dr. Pollock and experts in sarcoma surgery to, incure, to try to ensure a curative, we call R0, margin negative operation. So this is what we face when we first see a patient. We need to decide how to approach it surgically uh, and then decide if it's not surgically resectable, are there systemic ways to decrease it? If it's residual disease, how best to treat it? And of course, if it's metastatic, uh, how best, what therapies we would offer in that situation. Next slide, please. Now, I just want to make a mention before I talk about targeted therapy. I mentioned chemotherapy, but everybody wants to know about immunotherapy, okay? It's a hot topic. Everybody wants a drug that turns on their immune system. They want a drug that activates something called the T cell, the cancer-fighting cell of the body. And this is actually the first study uh, from SARC, which is a large group of cancer centers who treat patients with sarcoma, giving a drug called pembrolizumab that is an immune activating agent. It targets a protein called PDL1. That is a protein that, when inhibited with this drug pembrolizumab, also called Keytruda, will activate the T cell to fight cancer. Now on one end, this is a, a, a little complex, but on one side here, we have something called a, a, a um, spider plot. It looks like a spider. And what you can see is that the lines going up are patients that progress with the cancer. The lines going down, which is the bottom really asp half of this uh, curve, are those responded to, to, the, to the therapy despite in the setting of this treatment. And you can see that not only they, do they decrease significantly, so on the 100%, which is a major response, but they were actually very durable, lasting for months, even for years. Now the question comes up, what sarcomas were these? And if you look at the other half of this graph, buried in those bars that are going down, there are patients with liposarcoma that have benefited from pembrolizumab. There's another drug called uh, nivolumab or Devo, and these are PD-1 inhibitors but the overall response rate in liposarcoma is only about 10%. One out of 10 patients will respond to this drug therapy. The problem is we do not have a good biomarker for selection. Some people do measure a, a target called PD-1, PDL one is the ligand. And if it's highly positive, that would be a patient I would actually give immunotherapy early on. Uh, but we have to, it's, there's no true definitive way to select patients for this type of approach. But it is a treatment option not to be forgotten uh, for patients with this particular type of sarcoma. And this is the patient who had, D, these are D-diff liposarcoma patients, the more aggressive subtype that I've been talking about. Next slide, please. Well, now I'm gonna switch to the CDK4 MDM2 story. This is the new hot story going on in oncology and sarcoma. Uh, 
uh, both this gene, these two genes are in chromosome 12Q, and they're overexpressed in about 90% of the well diff, D diff liposarcoma. You will not find this in the mixoid, you will not find this in the pleomorphic. If you see this, MDM2 positivity, it is a liposarcoma, the D diff or the well diff type. Now, what do we mean by amplified? Ordinarily, everybody has two copies of a gene. When a gene gets amplified, rather than two copies, you have a thousand copies, 10,000 copies. That's amplification. And that means that tumor is driven by a major oncogene. I compare it to the V8 engine of a Cadillac versus the engine of a Prius. The Prius barely gets up the hill, no offense to electric cars, but the V8 engine does. And that drives the liposarcoma cell. That is a discovery that probably transformed the field about a decade ago. Both these genes are amplified together and has resulted in a major effort to define drugs that block those genes, turn them off, like turn them off the engine of the car, and in doing so, kill the cancer cell. And these are specific to liposarcoma. Next slide. Now, I'm not going to talk about the preclinical discovery. I was involved in those early studies. I was with Dr. Pollock. But the first drug test was called Ibrance, palbociclib, and it blocks both CDK4 and CDK6. This drug is an exquisite inhibitor of the CDK4 pathway, and we showed early on this drug will block the growth of liposarcoma in the laboratory, and we took it to clinical trials, and we showed that it has a moderate effect on suppressing tumor growth in patients with liposarcoma, all published data, Journal of Clinical Oncology and others. There's another drug that's also now finishing clinical trial called lymphamaciclib. Pavlociclib is from Pfizer. You may actually rep recognize a drug called Ibrance. It actually is approved in breast cancer for a very comparable mechanism, not specifically for overexpression, but for some other ways of activating this pathway. It activates something called cell cycle, which accelerates tumor growth. Blocking this pathway slows the tumors down, eventually inhibits them, and has a way of destroying them as well. So it's approved in breast cancer and is now available also through NCCN mechanisms for patients with liposarcoma. Next slide. There's actually a patient who had a, a deed of lipo. You can see that big mass in the center actually was part of the, there's the DDIF component, that sclerotic dense component surrounded by the well diff, that's that yellow um, yellow arrow, the, the DDIF, the well diff is the red. But looking at that DDIF component, the aggressive one we have to be worried about that over time on palbociclib, the CDK4 inhibitor, that tumor mass essentially went away within um, a year of treatment. It does take time, but it shows that people can be on this drug for a long time without tumor growth, as long as you're patient with it and give it time to work. This is not a drug that works within weeks. It has, takes time to work, but we can see benefits in patients who benefit from this. Now, how to select that patient population is also a challenge, and lots of work is going on to identify the subpopulation of patients with well diff, D diff liposarcoma, who we can treat up front, knowing they're going to benefit from the therapy. At the moment, we don't have that information. It's part of ongoing clinical research. Next slide. One other thing, I mentioned immunotherapy. Well, there's an ongoing national trial combining palbociclib with immunotherapy. There's laboratory data showing that if you block that pathway, CDK4, it makes the immunotherapy more effective. So there's a national trial that's going on through the cooperative groups in a randomized fashion where half the patients are going to be randomized to palbociclib, and the other half are randomized to palbociclib and a PD-1 inhibitor, not pembrolizumab, but one called simipolumab from a company called Regeneron. The same class of drugs. And for patients who get palbociclib, they'll be allowed to add on the second drug if the single agent palbo doesn't work. So the end of the study, everybody will have the ability to get the combination. That study is open, is accruing, and if, you're, have a, if you are a patient or no patient with liposarcoma, for which there's no surgical option, this would be a very reasonable clinical study, open nationwide, West Coast, East Coast, all over the country, 300 plus sites. Please look into it through uh, your oncologist.
Next slide. Now, what about MDM2? I mentioned CDK4. The other oncogene amplified is MDM2. It is pathognomonic. This is all the sarcomas that we looked at to see if MDM2 was amplified. That is, is there an increase in 10,000 copies, 1,000 copies? Does it happen in other sarcoma types? This is all those sarcoma other types, and we do not see it except in liposarcoma. And there isn't a, there's one newer tumor, just to be aware, called intimal sarcoma, where you see it, but that's a really, really rare sarcoma, maybe 80 to 100 cases a year. It happens in the, uh, usually up in the upper uh, chest, uh, often from the uh, arteries or the major blood vessel. It's different, but this is a major diagnostic test. If you're MDM2 positive in a sarcoma, you're most almost likely to be a liposarcoma. Next slide. Now, it has been the holy grail. This is the list of all the drugs that have been developed in the last decade chasing inhibition of MDM2. And I don't have time to go through all of them. I have a whole slide set of half an hour in this whole, whole history and the complexity and the problems and, and, and how do we get to where we are. But I want to just mention one or two things about the ongoing and completed active clinical study. It's with this drug called BI907828, uh, Brigamadlin. It's from Behringer Ingelheim. They have just completed a national randomized study, actually international, of several hundred patients comparing doxorubicin to the MDM2 inhibitor. It is not yet reported out. We hope to hear about this very soon. We do have, we call phase one early data with the drug as a single agent. Next slide. This is data published from Gallander and Cancer Discovery. And what I'm showing you is something called a waterfall plot. A waterfall plot is every bar down is a patient's had a decrease in the size of their tumor. Every bar up is a patient who's progressed. If you progress more, than, if you decrease more than 30%, that's called a partial response. If you decrease 100%, that's a complete response. And you can see here that patients with the well-diff DDF liposarcoma, the number of responders are MDM2 positive, 90% in the series. And they're actually non-liposarcomas as well. That's why not all of them are amplified. But in those who are liposarcoma, the response rates were quite exceptional. Next slide. Just to show what they look like, these are patients with liposarcoma. In fact, they had well diff liposarcoma. This is, these are fatty tumors. This is a, a CAT scan of a rather large mass, one in the abdomen and one in the liver. This is not surgical receptible. And after 15 months of therapy, the tumor was substantially decreased in size. The bottom one is another patient with liposarcoma, and that's a mass in the right lower pelvis. And after 12 weeks of therapy, this actually is pretty fast. The tumor size had decreased significantly. After 60 weeks, it's barely detectable. So based on this data, this has now completed a randomized phase three study of BI, of the Brig Brigamadlin drug versus doxorubicin for first-line therapy. If it's positive, this drug will become the new standard of care for patients with metastatic or unresectable li liposarcoma in the United States. And we wait expectantly and hopefully for the data. I think that's my last slide. So I, I just want to give you an overview. The pro pathway to progress in sarcoma is not clearly marked out. I think it's a great slide. Uh, we still have a long way to go. Uh, but I think we're making progress. And we should be hopeful. I think if we get an MDM2 inhibitor, it'll be a breakthrough after years and years of trying. CDK4 is already underway. And I think we're just beginning to uh, really go deep and deeper into therapeutic approaches to build on the surgical expertise and with progress and working together and as teams, we can do incredible things today in oncology, things that just weren't available and possible even several years ago. And I'll stop at that point and open up for questions. We'll gladly field any questions from the group. Thank you very much. Thank you both so much. That was absolutely wonderful information. Um, thank you for your time. We do have a couple of questions here from um, the group. Um, I'm going to start out with um, a question about retroperitoneal well-differentiated liposarcoma. Um, the question is, it seems like surgery is still uh, really the most effective treatment. 
Um, is there anything new um, that is specific for retroperitoneal well differentiated liposarcoma? Um, can you suggest strategies um, that, or strategies or current research that are specific for this particular subtype of liposarcoma? Sure. Um, I'll take uh, maybe first crack at that. The key, as Gary alluded to, is an effective surgical resection, but it does not exist in a vacuum. So we know that the size and the location of the tumor in the retroperitoneum will give you a pretty good indication about whether or not a surgeon is going to be able to remove the total sarcoma, meaning getting it down to a negative margin resection as the gold standard. And if it is clear from the anatomic display that one can see on a scan that that's not going to be the case, then it's very, very important to consider non-surgical therapies first. Right now, consideration for neoadjuvant before surgery, chemotherapy, preoperative radiation therapy are both undergoing extensive clinical trial evaluation. And we're hoping very much that these result in a positive treatment arm so that we will have more to throw up against these tumors at the time of ultimate surgical resection. The patient that Gary presented at the very end of his talk in which there was a clear response to the drug over the course of an approximate year of therapy is exactly the reasoning why we like to use drugs prior to surgery, although for many patients that appears to be counterintuitive. The smaller the tumor after drug therapy, the easier it is to remove and the less likely that patients will incur complications in that removal. Plus, because the tumor has responded, and if at the time of surgery, surgery we are able to remove all of the visible macroscopic disease, the fact that they have responded provides additional justification if they can tolerate it to continue that same drug where you've already seen success in that given patient. I, I can add that the, the well diffs are, are challenging, but you know, frankly, it's sometimes hard to separate out a well diff from a D diff because I've seen some well diffs grow like D diffs. It's a it's like a well diff in transition. And the problem is you can biopsy one part of the tumor and get well diff, and then you can biopsy another part of the tumor and get D diff, right. even though the initial biopsy is called well diff. So there's a sampling error to try to figure out what is really D diff from well diff, makes it as very complex. I'll go back to that last slide from the Behringer study. That actually was a patient with a well differentiated liposarcoma. I mean, their well diff has MDM2 too. And um, I think the study is really addressing the DDIF population, but I'm hoping that we can come back and readdress that drug for the well diff population. And there are discussions underway how to do that in a subsequent study. I think we have to wait for the outcome of the more aggressive DDIF. That's what they went after first. But you can see that even well diff, you can have a pretty aggressive tumor and we need new therapies. MDM2 certainly is a reasonable target. CDK4 is also amplified in that disease. And I have used for these growing, even well diff lipos, I've, I've used that approach as well. And that has had some benefit, but you know they're more reserved for the DDIF, which tends to be the more aggressive. And I think we always try to surgically resect well diff you can actually observe well diff uh, without a complication as well. And that's always a team-based discussion. When when do you resect? How long do you watch for? And, and how many surgeries can a patient have uh, for these types of sarcomas? And I have patients have four and five operations and you know over many, many years. And and I guess the and so that's another separate discussion. I hope that answers your question. But it's not simple. It was simple to give you one answer, but if you've had a number a couple of ways of looking at this problem. Sure, thank you. Um, this is actually related. Um, we have a question about whether well-differentiated liposarcomas 
can turn into dedifferentiated liposarcomas and whether um, their patients have experienced different answers from different physicians at different institutions. And can you speak to that? It's an area of controversy, but generally speaking, patients that start off with well differentiated if followed over time will frequently, not invariably, but frequently, more than 50% of the time certainly, develop at least a focus of dedifferentiation, if not having the entire tumor becoming dedifferentiated over time. But frankly, we've seen every conceivable pattern, patients who've had wild diff and then have failed with D-diff, patients who have D-diff and then have failed as wild diff. And I think it points to the reality that these are very large tumors. They're the size of a volleyball, typically, or bigger. And if you took that three-dimensional tumor and you rendered it as a two-dimensional plane, and then you took biopsies from that surface, at best, you're going to probably sample three, maybe 5% of that surface area. So when we see both types of histologies in that context, it would imply that the area of D-diff or the area of wild diff was simply missed in the biopsy itself because we have to go with what we can see macroscopically. Otherwise, it's pretty much a random goose chase. Yeah, I, I agree that there's a high likelihood that well diff will become D diff. And that's why, in fact, I favor surgery with the well diff, that we don't want to be sitting on watching a well diff for too long because if there's a, at any given point, it can transform to the D diff, which is the more aggressive type. So that's really the rationale for surgical resection of a well diff. It itself will not cause you. Harm. In fact, I think many of these well diffs are picked up after years of being underdiagnosed. They're often picked up by an incidental exam finding, but that patient is lucky that hasn't already undergone transformation. And I don't really feel comfortable sitting on that tumor waiting for that transformation to take place if it's surgical resectable. So then I'll call Dr. Pollock, call one of my surgical colleagues, and say, I think we should move ahead with the surgical resection uh, and then decide whether the patient's appropriate as you know, safe medically and, and, and other factors. But if, unless there's some medical comorbidity that would prevent a surgical resection, I would favor. It also points to the importance of serial imaging, serial analysis, and serial presentation at multidisciplinary expert sarcoma conferences, because you can see the patterns over time as they change, and that will frequently in not only inform the conversation, but inform the decisions about when to intervene. Um, I have two questions that are sort of related to the topic that you've been, um, of the last two questions. Um, do you see or notice a pattern in the change of growth or the rate of growth um, relative to the histology? When I'm asked that by other patients in other contexts, I, I this will sound a little bit glib, but I tell them that the only thing we can say with certainty is that the rate of growth is predictably unpredictable, meaning they will grow faster and then they'll slow down. There's acceleration, deceleration, and you can't very well predict what's going to happen. Apropos Gary's comments about always be thinking about, is there a surgical advantage to be had at this time? Thank you. And, um, and, and, one thing that, and the, in fact, the fast growing tumors are the ones that may be the most difficult to resect and at the greater risk of metastatic disease. One of my surgical colleagues, Dr. Pollock knows well, Dr. Singer, show the tumors that grow greater than a centimeter a month, even though they may appear resectable, have the worst outcome. Because yeah. the risk of recurrence after that rapid growing tumor is very high, both local, regionally, and distantly. So you know, I think if you have a fast growing tumor, you don't want to let it get to that point. Right. That's not, not in your best interest. So the key point is when do you intervene surgically? Because if it's going to be really fast, you miss that window, you may have missed the optimal point for curability and you don't want to do that. I think we have time probably for one more question. I think this one's going to be a little bit tough, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, 
what are your recommendations for patients that for whatever reason, whether it be um, practical, financial, or otherwise, are unable to get to a sarcoma center in order to get their surgery? Well, there are 55 comprehensive cancer centers in the United States and 71 cancer NCI certified cancer centers. That's a larger number than there are sarcoma centers, but almost all of them have sarcoma programs. So that if you can't come to a designated sarcoma center, you should at least try to seek the expertise. And having said that, Many, many, if not most of the current clinical trial protocols that may be initiated at major centers are also available throughout the United States. Gary, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think there's there's access. Um, get on a plane, you know, find a center. Uh, we got two in Ohio, one in Columbus and one in Cleveland. You know, uh, air flight is brings you to wherever you want to go today. But I think having a specialist in sarcoma is life saving for this disease. Anything less than that, you want to. I think any cancer, you should ask your oncologist. Your sir, how many did you do? How many how many colectomies? How many Whipples? How many extremity resections? How many retroperitoneal tumors do you take out? And if they say one or whatever, so I would definitely want to go to the expert. Why not? We op are open to everybody, okay? We're not just limited to Ohio. I was in New York for a long time as two. So we are available to help guide you to get to the right group and the right team. We meet every week as a group. Every case is reviewed. I'm sure Dr. Pollock has the same system. This is the way you approach it, team-based. We just make these, we decide pre-op, post-op, you know, concomitant, whatever, treatment metastatic disease, that's the way you have to approach sarcoma, liposarcoma, or whatever tumor type you have. So mm -hmm. that's now my closing. I'd like to take one or two seconds on those few questions systemically that came up, just to answer them quickly. There's a question mm -hmm. about palpable in combination with radiotherapy, with chemotherapy. No, I don't do it. I do give palbo because of the palbo immunotherapy data that's now ongoing. If you had prior palbo, you're not ineligible for the trial. And if you had prior immunotherapy, you're not a candidate. Or if you're not a candidate for another reason, I, I think palbo and immunotherapy is still a reasonable off-label indication, but you have to do it by a person who knows what they're doing. But I do not give palbo with chemotherapy. There's actually data that the chemotherapy may be affected negatively by palbo. And I'm not, so that's that's question one. Question two. If you had prior, that there was the RAIN study, which is the RAIN MDM2 inhibitor, middle matlin, that was a prior negative study. We didn't talk about that. It was a second line study of MDM2 versus trabectidine. That drug I said doesn't work really well in liposarcoma. Well, it did not work very well, but nor that it did that MDM2 inhibitor. We do not know why, but prior MDM2 negative in that study does not preclude you from getting this drug. But the clinical Brigham Adlin study is closed, so you can't get any MDM2 inhibitor anywhere in the United States now. It is a problem. We're seeing lots of MDM2 positive patients, but there's no clinical study open and there's no compassionate access pending the outcome of the Brigham Adlin study. So the result of that study is now critical for the national cancer population, but we have to wait for the data and I do not know when it's gonna read out, but I hope for everybody's sake, it's positive and it's sooner than later. And as far as the mix of liposarcoma, high grade, there was a question about that. Uh, if it was high grade, that depends on the number of those small, on those round cells greater than 5%. The question then is how big, and if it was large and high grade, I would give adjuvant chemotherapy and large high grade. Again, I don't know the details here, so I'm just getting from the information I have. We would give local regional radiotherapy because Local recurrence is high for these high-grade sarcomas, and we give, would give, it wasn't given pre-op, we would give post-operative radiotherapy. But again, I, I don't know all the details, and I can't give a definitive answer. And I say that's true of everything we said today. We're giving you our experience based on overall populations, our general experience, but we're not in position to give definitive answer to your clinical problems without having all the medical records in front of us 
So just to, as a caveat, I'm here to, we're here to help everybody, but if I can't really give that type of definitive information without having more pathologic or clinical data to give you the definitive answer. And I'll stop at that point. I'd like to just inject one final comment. I looked at the chat and someone said, not all of us can get on airplanes and that's true, but not to put Dean and Christy on the spot, but if you have access to a computer, you can type in the word sarcoma, Sarcoma Foundation of America pops up and Dean and Christy are backed up by a medical advisory board of what, 20, 25 sarcoma experts from around the United States, and they could help triage your questions to one or another of these experts, Gary and I included, in order to make sure that you have the best chance to get the treatment that you need. And please do, please do reach yeah. out to us. And I'd also like to point out that we do have a grant system where um, you can apply for financial aid for us and uh, from us and uh, to cover the costs of travel. <clears throat> On both the patient and the practitioner side, we are indebted to the SFA. Yeah. And you. I was honored by one of their major Nobel Ability Awards, and it was one of the yeah. biggest honors of my life. And I have to thank them for their support over the years. They have been exceptional and a huge advocate for patients with sarcoma. And we need people like SFA, the Sarcoma Foundation, and Dean and Christy for the work they do. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You and uh, yep. And with that, we'll need to wrap up our session. Uh, yep. Thank you again, Drs. Pollock and Schwartz, for taking the time to be with us and sharing your expertise. Uh, we we appreciate all that you do for the sarcoma community and especially the liposarcoma community. I'd like to thank everyone who logged in today to be a part of the discussion and to Beringer Ingelheim for their sponsorship. As a reminder, today's session was recorded and a link will be posted to SFA's website within the next few days at curesarcoma.org. Uh, this now concludes the discussion. Uh, please take this opportunity to complete the survey on your screen. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.